Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning. Excited about this morning's message. And the Holy Spirit comes on you sometimes. I don't know if you all realize this. The Bible says He promises to give you power. But it doesn't promise to give you eloquence. (laughs) The honest truth is sometimes when the Holy Spirit overwhelms you, it's hard to talk. And I'm going to try to get through this this morning. But I just really felt this message hit me about as hard as anything ever has. And so I just am excited to preach, but at the same time letting you know that it may not be picture-perfect TV quality. But hopefully it's exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted. And that's all we need to hear. You don't need to hear me. We want to hear from Him. Amen. So let's just bow our heads together and just pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just want to hear from You. That You would open up the heavens, Lord God, and You would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to see and to hear and to understand and to receive what Your Spirit is saying to Your church. Jesus Christ, just come and just fill this room. Come walk in this room and come speak to Your people. You're still walking through the the lampstands. You're still guarding Your church. You still hold us in the palm of Your hand. And so right now, here this morning, at Cornerstone Community Church, may there just be a fresh word from Your throne room. Father, I just get me out of your way that it would just be your voice that's heard here today. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. This morning reminds me, I heard about an old country preacher lived way out in West Texas. And he went to church one Sunday morning, and I mean, it was just pouring down the rain, the wind was blowing. And there was only one person in there that morning, one lonesome cowboy who was sitting there in the pews and... Nobody else came, and he walked up to him and he said, well, what do you think? He said, nobody else is here. Do you think I should go ahead and preach? And the cowboy said, well, preacher, I'm not the smartest man, but if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd still feed it. <laughs> and so the pastor launched into his sermon, went on and on, and about two and a half later, he concluded it. And he said to the, to the cowboy, he said, so what do you think about that sermon? And he said, well, pastor, this is kind of the way I see it. He said, if I went out to feed my cows and only one showed up, he said, I sure wouldn't dump the whole load on him. (laughs) This morning's word, I'm going to try not to dump the whole load, but I'm not promising anything. God has a lot to say this morning, and He's looking for people that are ready to receive it. The title of today's message is Getting Ready for Revival. Getting Ready for Revival. It reminds me of an old man I heard about. He uh, couldn't hear well, and this went on for years. And finally, his family begged and begged, and he went to the doctor to have some hearing tests done. And the hearing doctor ordered him the most high-tech, the newest quality uh, hearing devices you could get on the market. And then he got these, and about a month later, he went back for his checkup, and the doctor's listening and checking him out. He said, sir, this is amazing. He said, your hearing is back up to 100%. He said, your family must just be so excited. And and the old man said, well, you know, actually, doctor, he said, they don't know that I can hear them. He said, I've just been listening to all their conversations. He said, I've already changed my will three times now. (laughs) That old guy was concerned about where his stuff was going to go. And God is about ready to make an outpouring that we haven't seen before. And He cares about where His stuff is going. He wants to get His people ready for revival. I don't know how to get into this. But the other night, uh, a couple of you all were there. I was at a a service way down in Cross Lanes. And and I bowed down to pray. And and I was just seeking the Lord. And the presence of God came all over me. And, And He said, He spoke this phrase. And sometimes God will speak to you in ways that you kind of almost got to research what's he talking about. But he he said, the wine is in the water. And he he spoke it again. The wine is in the water. And all of a sudden, John chapter 2 came to my mind. And I'm not going to put it up on the screen. If you have Bibles or Bible phones, read it yourself. It's there for you. But in that passage... At a wedding in Cana of Galilee, they had run out out of wine. And Jesus' mother walks up to him and says, they've run out of wine. And, 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 And God evidently spoke to Christ then because He didn't think it was time, but God said it was. 
And, and, and he said, go get the water pots. And I don't know if you know anything. Let me stop here for just a second. Those water pots, where it says, were for purification. In other words, out of everything there, these were the things where you washed your dirty hands. And where you took the dirty pots, the stuff that was messy and dirty. It wasn't clean. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't perfect. And you, you washed those vessels. You washed your hands. This water was, it was dirty. These pots were used for everyday use. And God was saying that the wine is in the water. Jesus said, go fill up the normal, everyday, average pots. Because that's what I'm going to use. And the question is, because I believe, listen, there's prophecies going back clear to the 1970s over West Virginia and revival. And God is saying to our state, it's time to get ready for it. But the question is, why West Virginia? Listen, God wants to do the, he wants to do the extraordinary through the ordinary. The wine is in the water. You may say, I'm just a school teacher, and God says, exactly, the wine is in that water. You may say, I just work at a factory, and God is saying, my wine is in that water. You say, I'm just a well tender. I just work in the oil field. I'm just a regular dirty blue collar worker. And God says exactly what I'm looking for. Come on, church. The wine is in the water. It's in the everyday. It's in the ordinary. It's in the thing the world wasn't looking for, wasn't expecting, wasn't ever looking for it even ever happened. That's where it's coming. Hallelujah. Woo. But why has it been 2,000 years? Remember when they finally delivered the one. The, the guy running the party says, oh, you always save. Listen, you always bring the best at the beginning. Why has it been 2,000 years? Because the world is so doubting. But I, God, I just heard him so clearly say, I'm still saving the best for last. Yeah. Somebody grab a hold of that. Right now, 2019, the best for last. Did you hear that? Somebody needs to hear this. The best that God did wasn't even in the book of Acts. That's where it started. The best is for now. Come on. Whew. This area is covered in prayer and prophecy. And last November, the Lord brought me in here. I felt like a madman. Because everybody been saying, we're going to have revival. We're going to have revival. It was always future tense. And listen, as long as you're saying you're going to have revival, I can tell you one thing, you'll never have it. Amen. Because as long as you're saying you're going to, you're excusing yourself from it today. Amen. Oh, that'll preach. I know it'll stomp on toes, but it'll preach. I heard a pastor say on Friday night, every message God ever gives, he'll, he'll wrap it up in no fence to see if you'll receive it. It won't always feel good. Truth sometimes hurts, church, but it will set you free. Amen. Oh, and I began to share this word, and I was like, God, He's saying now is the time for the prophecies to begin to be fulfilled. Amen. That the words over West Virginia to now begin to happen. Amen. That revival isn't tomorrow. Revival is today. Yes. It's now. Hallelujah. And we begin to see God move like we never had. How many of y'all were in the revival in April here? Man, what an outpouring. And we just begin to see God move like we never had before. Listen, for the past month, there's been an outpouring going on in Summersville, West Virginia. Night after night, day after day, God moving, God healing, God saving. Listen, when God says now is the time, He means it. And when we said now is the time, He showed up when people were expecting and believing. And this morning, I believe God is saying that we are to get ready because the river is rising. Amen. Amen. 
Revival's been happening, but we haven't entered anywhere near its fullness. The river's rising, and God is saying to get ready for what's about ready to take place. Because it's going to be so much more than what we could ask or think or imagine according to the power that works within us. See, what we've been calling revival up to now, the Bible calls normal. It is normal church, according to the Scripture, for people to be saved, healed, delivered, sanctified, lives changed forever. That is just normal biblical Christianity. But God's saying the river is rising. He's raising the bar that we might rise with Him. When the water rises, it brings up everything else with it. Somebody hear that. When the water rises, it brings up everything else with it. And God is calling His church to get ready because the rivers are rising. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 2.17. It shall come to pass in the last days. Think about that. If 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Peter was convinced we were in the last days, where are we now? And I might even say the last of the last of the last days. Amen, Andy. Where are we now? He saves the best for last. The wine is in the water. And says God that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. All people. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see dreams, your old men shall or see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. He goes on to say, Upon my servants and maidservants. The water is in the wine, he's saying. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old, educated, uneducated. None of those things matter. God's going to pour out his spirit, he says, in the last days. Amen. And so the church is always concerned about how much money we have. How much talent we have on the platform, right? What's the latest program? What's the church down the road doing? What what are they doing in California? It's a mega church because if we copy that, maybe all these things that God never told us to focus on. He's telling us to focus on Him. He's saying, right where you are, just a plain old water pot. That's what I'm going to use. The only thing He says you need. Is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to Me. Turn to your neighbor and say, when He says you, He's talking to you. When He says you, He's talking to you. You shall be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What takes an apostle who was afraid of a little slave girl so much that he would change even his language and begin to curse at her to deny Jesus to 40 days later stand up in front of all Jerusalem and win 3,000 to Jesus Christ? None other than the Holy Spirit. None other than the Holy Spirit. God is saying to Cornerstone, you're on the verge of ready. You're on the verge of ready. The river is rising and you're in the verge of stepping into everything He has for you. See, there's a difference here. When the river rises, you find some people, they want to splash around right on the edge. And that's the fun part of revival. There is the fun part. It's fun. The cold chills, the great music, all that. It's fun. There's nothing wrong with it. Right? Right? But if there's a real flood coming and there's a boat, what are you going to do? You're going to get inside. Somebody hear this. God is saying it's time to stop playing on the shore and get in the boat with Him. And when you're in the boat and the river begins to rise and move, you just go wherever the river goes. 
It's time for the church to learn to ride the river of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Where, listen, there may be a turn up here. Let's follow Him. He may take us in a direction we've never been before. Something, listen, we've never done before. He may have us do things we've never thought of before. Hallelujah! Out goes the door, church as usual. Church that I could think of. Church that I could plan. Church that any book is even written about besides the Word of God. That's what I want to have. It's time for church I can't describe, I can't plan, and I can't control. I want it to be out of my hands and into His hands. And at the same time, as we let God do all these things, I believe there's a, that's the spiritual side to it. Listen, our God, don't cut me off right now, but our spiritual God is not impractical all the time. There is a side to this that He will expect us to cooperate with. Listen, Matthew 28, 19. What's our part? He says, Go. Go. When the river rises, get in the boat and go. He did not say, sit. He did not say to the church, stay. And that's what the church does often, isn't it? We sit and wait for God to move, and He sits and waits and says, I told you to move. Go therefore and make disciples. The primary command here is actually to make disciples. In other words, the emphasis is this. He expects that you'll go. But He's saying as you're going, make disciples. What's a disciple? If you're taking notes, simple, a learner. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you learning? Hallelujah. Well then, how do you, what's a disciple maker? A teacher. We're all called to be learners. But listen, we're also all called in some sense to be teachers. Yep. Amen. Doesn't mean you'll stand up with a whiteboard. <laughs> you'll mostly do it with your life. Yep. And being an example for people and an encouragement. Amen. But we are all called to be disciples and we are all called to make disciples. We're all called to be learners and teachers. He says, of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the first step in that disciple making is teaching them about baptism, leading them into baptism. It explains the Gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a public witness that they've received Christ. But notice what else he says in verse 20. Teaching them. The word teach is to cause to learn, by the way. Listen, in the Bible, the word teach doesn't mean to give information. It means to change their life. Did somebody hear that? You ever had a teacher that just spouts out information, but you don't know what they're talking about and don't care what they're talking about? The Bible is never meant to be taught that way. The Bible should be taught in such a way that the Holy Spirit illuminates it, brings it to life in your heart and mind, and it changes your life. It's not meant to just be heard. What it's meant to do is to be ingested. Oh, did y'all hear that? The Bible says to receive the engrafted Word. Do you know what engrafting means? It's where you take two plants and they bind together. They become one. God wants to take His Word and engraft it in your heart. Where, where His Word and you, you just become entwined. You're one. Who? That'll preach, by the way. Teaching them not to just know, but to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. He gives us promise, I'll never leave you for or forsake you. I'm with you to the end of the age. The river is rising, church, and it's time to get in the boat and go. Who? He's pouring out His Spirit. I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I don't know if this is the best way, but I remember the prophet Elisha. He encountered a widow. Please stay with me. And she was in debt. And her husband, who won their, their food, their income, had passed away. And so in order to pay her debt, she was going to have to sell her two sons into slavery. Because that's the way you could pay off your debts at that time. In order to pay her debts. And so she's going to lose her sons. She's just lost her husband. And she's, she's torn down. And, and the prophet says, what do you have in your house? What do you have? And I ask you this morning, 
what do you have? And she said, I have one jar of oil. He said, go all through the neighborhood and gather as many vessels as you can, as many other containers. And he said, and not just a few. In other words, grab as many as you can. And so she goes all through the community. She's getting these containers, any kind of container she can find. And she brings them all back to the house. And he says, look, I want you to take your jar of oil and begin to pour into their jars of oil. Come on. And as she began to pour, it just kept pouring and pouring. And she poured into each vessel. Listen, and it just poured and poured and poured and poured. And the only time it stopped is when she ran out of somebody else to pour into. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Who? We're not just called to learn how to be disciples. Getting ready for revival is the church learning how to make them. This revival is not just going to be about us getting poured into. The next step in getting ready is learning how to be poured through. Somebody hear that? He's going to save your family. He's going to save your children. He's going to save your community. But He's going to do it through you. He'll take care of all your needs, but the thing is, is He's going to need other needs too. He's not just going to bless you. He's going to bless people through you. Come on, church. We're not just going to be disciples. We're going to be disciple makers. I remember teaching my son Lincoln how to ride without training wheels. It amazes me nowadays. If this is your kid, please don't walk out. But if your kid is 12, they should not still have training wheels. We are protecting people from too much stuff nowadays. I'll just leave it at that. Oh, I rode in the back of the pickup truck a lot, and I'm still here. Talk about no child safety seat. I survived. You know what? And God is saying to the church, it's time to get the training wheels off. And we've been saying, oh, but it's too hard. It's hard work. He said, yes, it is work. In fact, it's hard work. Oh, somebody's going to get real quiet again. It's okay. It's all right. You know what? He's already given us a vision as a church. And as we've stepped into revival, you know what I thought? I thought, well, surely to goodness, he'll change the vision of the church now. And he said, your vision came from my word. He said... Revival doesn't change my word. It just brings you into alignment with my word. Amen. Ooh. And so we're not changing the vision of the church. And God is saying this, the vision will work if you'll work it. Amen. See, if you're going to ride without training wheels, you've got to take off running, don't you? Yep. And you've got to jump on that bike and you've got to pedal it. But once you start pedaling, guess what happens? Momentum kicks in. And balance happens. And you know what? God's been waiting for the church to get the training wheels off and take off running. Amen? Amen? And begin to pour out. The first step in our vision at Cornerstone is to live. He's telling the church, us as disciples, to begin to learn to live. Begin to learn to live. This is why we're here on Sunday morning. Amen! Amen! Listen, it's nothing new. This is the place where we've been learning how to live for the Lord. It's the place where we've been learning how to walk and live an abundant life. It's where we've been learning to walk and live in a way that that shows the world that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The way of the world just leads to death. Romans 6.23 That the payment for sin is death. And the Bible says this in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and what? Fallen short of the glory of God. And so guess what? Every single one of us owes a sin debt, don't we? Every single one of us has a debt we cannot pay because none of us are perfect. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
When you come to church, listen, a church that doesn't preach the gospel is not a church that doesn't tell people how to receive Christ and why they need to receive Christ. To let them know that to die without Christ is to die without hope. But to die with Christ is to die with everything. Amen. Amen. The word gift means grace. If you look up the word in the, in, the, in the Greek, it literally is charisma. It's the word grace. It's a free gift you can't earn. By grace you are saved through faith. And we've got people all through our culture that are religious. They've been to church. They follow some rules and they think that will get them to heaven. But the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. And so realizing that I'm a sinner, I realize that I need a Savior. Amen? Amen. And when I know I need a Savior, and I hear this, that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God is raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. I realize that being saved is not complicated. Being saved is not something I have to strive for. Being saved is just like any other gift. I just need to receive it. Amen. I need to repent of my sin. Say, God, sorry, for, forgive me of my sin. I receive your salvation. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Come be the Lord of my life. See, the, the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy all through our culture. Why is God wanting to use West Virginia? Because when you look at a, at a 50 state ranking, we, we, have, we have the privilege of almost being number 50 in anything that's bad. We do, don't we? But the Bible says that the last shall be The enemy's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, but he's setting us up for revival. Because God is sovereign. God hasn't fallen asleep over West Virginia. He hasn't forgotten about America either. Amen. Oh, I felt this burning in me this morning. I'm just going to go there. I told you, sometimes the Holy Spirit makes you sloppy. You just have to follow with me. When you look at West Virginia, and, and the, really the birth and development of America, its source industrially was here. In these mountains. It wasn't in the big cities. It, it, was, it was in the haulers and the hills of West Virginia. You don't realize this. But every bit of steel that built every skyscraper, every car, every plane, every train, everything across this great land of ours, the fire that made the steel came from these mountains and hills. The fire that built America came out of the hills of Appalachia. Without the fire of Appalachia, there are no skyscrapers. There is no New York City. It couldn't be built without West Virginia, Kentucky, these places that the world has looked down on. And right now, America is suffering from the greatest spiritual deficit it's ever been in. We are seeing more suicides, more homicides, more overdoses. Somebody look at me this morning. Than we ever have. And we're seeing it the worst right here. But the last shall be first. And God is saying the fires of revival now that this nation needs to restore it are going to come out of the mountains and the hills again. There's a fire in these hills. There's a sound coming out of Appalachia. We know we need God because we have nowhere else to turn. I can't turn to money. I can't turn to things, but I can turn to God. Whew. Come on, that will preach if you listen. The thief does not come except to kill and to steal and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I love the Amplified. Have and enjoy life. Have it more abundantly to the full till it overflows. This is power, church. Power no matter what's going on to live in joy. Power no matter what's going on to still walk in love. Power no matter what's going on to still be at peace. 
Amen? Power no matter what the temptation to walk in victory. No matter what the circumstance to rise above it. And listen, this power that we have is contagious. The world is looking for something and we have what they're looking for. Listen, in Appalachia, we don't have the fame. We don't even have, most of us have the education or anything else that the world is looking for that they think they're looking for. But we do have the one answer that they haven't realized yet. But they're going to look at a place that was number 50 and everything the world was looking at rose to number one in the kingdom of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not going to be known for the fires of coal, but rather the fires of revival and the glory of God. Whew. Man, what do you come to Sunday morning for? Because you know you're going to hear the Word of God. When Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, He was immediately led by the Spirit into the desert. And after 40 days of fasting... The enemy came and tempted him. He says, if you be the Son of God, turn this rock into bread. And just to read the one Scripture, Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered, Jesus answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. It's interesting, in the Greek, the word there for word is actually spoken word. In other words, if you will get in the written Word and pray, the written Word will speak to you out loud. I don't understand this book. Just get to know the author. You don't need to be a scholar. You just need to be in relationship. If you know the author, the author will explain the book. Ooh. But you got to read it. I never understood anything I, I wouldn't get into. <sighs> Face it, if you're a Christian, one of these days you're going to have to read this thing. <laughs> it's just part of the package. And so when we come here on Sunday morning, we get into the Word. You know what else? We come here on Sunday morning, something else is just awesome is we get together and worship. We get together in the Word. We get together in worship. John chapter 4, verse 23. He says, But the hour is coming and now is. Now is. Now is the time when the true worshipers will worship the Father. How? In spirit and in truth. Why? Because God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I don't mean to offend, but I don't need a bunch of ritual to worship God. Because oftentimes ritual and religion gets in the way of relationship. And when you, when you are actually in the real presence, trust me, lighting candles and saying chants and doing all this stuff seems silly. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and it's okay. I'm not trying to be offensive, but to be honest with you, sometimes we need a little bit. When you have the real thing, you don't have to have the replacements anymore. Amen. That's right. That's good stuff. I gotta say it, church. Let's not get distracted by the show. Let's get our eyes on the king. Amen. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. He's everything. It all is to him and for him. God is getting us ready. Listen, the worship gets us ready. When I come and my heart is open to him, it's like it's like getting the lid off my life so he can pour in. You know what I'm saying? You get in the presence and your heart opens up and you worship in spirit and truth. It's like the lid comes off and the Holy Spirit starts pouring in. And then during worship, He's pouring in. And when the Word comes, He's still pouring in. Because the worship opened you up to this Holy Spirit and what He's doing. Worship gets us ready for God to fill us up. That's good, by the way. Jesus put it this way. He was, he was with the Jews on the, on the day... Listen, they had a festival, a festival of booths, and they would stay for a week living in tents, booths, and on the last day of the feast, the priest would do something. He would go down to the pool of Siloam, and all the people would follow him. They would have their shofars, by the way. They would be clapping, blowing their shofars, they're shouting. And the priest would go down and, and fill up this golden laver full of water. 
And they would walk back up the hill and they are dancing, shouting, listen, blowing the shofar. They're celebrating. And he would go back up to the altar and he would begin to pour out that water. And they would watch it run him back down the hill. And you know what? They all understood that this was a prophecy that God one day would pour out His Spirit on all flesh upon His sons and daughters. Listen, that His young men would see visions, that His old men would dream dreams. Somebody hearing this. Upon His servants and maidservants, He'd pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And they began to celebrate then when it was just a prophecy. But now we get to live in the reality. It was prophecy given then. It's prophecy fulfilled now. John 7, 38 says, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers. The waters rise in church. Rivers of living water. But this He spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing Him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was saying up to now this has been, this will happen. But what He was saying there is it's about ready to happen. It's going to go from we're going to have revival to we're having revival. Amen. Now's the time. And the river is rising. And the Holy Spirit wants to pour through you. I want you to hear something. When Jesus told them to go get those vessels of purification at the wedding, and they poured the water in, they didn't realize that it was new sweet wine until they poured it back out. The Dead Sea is dead because it it takes everything in, but it has no outlet. And so everything that's good that flows in eventually dies because it doesn't pour back out. And God is saying to His church, the river is rising, but He's not to come to you to be like a lake. He's coming to you like a river. And He wants to be released. And the greatest thing that the Holy Spirit, the greatest thing that the church has, listen, I believe in the gifts. I'm going to be talking about the gifts. But the, really, the most powerful thing we have that changes us more than anything, honestly, is the love of God. Amen. If there's anything that convinces the lost that what we have is real, it's our supernatural love. Amen. So the, He's teaching us to learn how to live. But number two, to get us ready for revival, He's saying it's time we learn how to love. It's time for the church to love. What is the great commandment? I'm going to read a scripture out of Luke 10 27, where even one of the lawyers quoted back to Jesus the great commandment. Even he understood what the great commandment is. He says, So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment is simply love God with everything you are and all that you have. Every part of your life directed towards Him. And that will be seen in evidence by this, how I love the people around me. Because God is what? God so loved the world that He what? Gave. And so if I have God's love, it will be seen by how I treat you and how I bless others around me. Listen, I've got to read a passage here. This may get me in trouble, but you'll forgive me, I hope. The Bible says you have to, by the way. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, says, Hatred stirs up strife. I love Proverbs. They're so practical. But love covers all sins. Hatred stirs up discord and dissension and strife. I'm going to use a couple old sayings here this morning. This may be a homely illustration, but I saw myself doing it, so I'm going to do it. There's two different reactions we can have when someone hurts us or we hear a good piece of juicy gossip. We all, as Christians, we're cooking something. And some of us, what does he say? Hatred does what? It and so you, somebody says something to you, you hear about something somebody did that was wrong, and then you, what do you do? You're standing over the stove and you reach up to the gas and you go, Whoa. 
and you turn that fire up and you start going, you're cooking up some strife. But the Bible says where there is no wood, the fire goes out. What does he say? But love does what? When I hear that juicy piece of gossip, somebody hurts me and I could, I could hold that unforgiveness. I can look at that stove and I think, you know what? They deserve that fire to go up. They deserve to be punished. And God says, and how many times have I forgiven you? And I say, well, you got a point there, God. <laughs> and so I decide instead to move it off that hot burner over on cool and put a lid on it. Amen. Gossip has no power when it stops with you. Amen. I don't know why, but the Lord's testing my reflexes this morning. <laughs> Cover it. Cover it. This Thursday... Or Wednesday, we had men's group, and we had a visitor. He's a new teacher, moved down here from Pennsylvania. Uh, his family hasn't even moved down yet, so he's down here by himself. And he decided to come to men's group. He's working with my wife, and he said he pulled into the parking lot. And, and some of you all were already standing outside just talking, just fellowshipping. Hadn't even gone in the building. And he said, I pulled in the parking lot. He said, and I, I could just sense the witness of the Spirit and that these were brothers in the Lord. And this guy, he's very, very shy. Like, my wife was amazed by this when I told her. Because apparently he's very bashful. But he just got out and he started talking to all, everybody like he had known them for years. There's something about fellowship with other believers that this is the truth. I, I, I honestly believe that we should have relationships with unbelievers. How am I going to win anybody if I don't know anybody? But there's something special. There's a bond between me and my brothers in Christ, between the two of us, that I don't have with somebody in the world. There's a witness of the Spirit. There's, there's a brotherhood. There's a sisterhood. And I think the enemy, one of the ways he's stealing, killing, destroying in the church is he's keeping us from those connections. Yep. Amen. That's right. That's right. See, our brother... He could have come from Pennsylvania and just sat at home that night. He could have been all by himself, let the enemy come in, bring depression, bring discouragement. But instead, he got out and fellowshiped. In Acts 2, verse 46, this is at the birth of the church. It says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. One accord means to have one purpose, a single mind. It means to be unanimous. They were all after the same thing, the Lord. They were in the temple. That would have been their church. That would have been the official church building. It says, in breaking bread from where? House to house. See, a lot of churches think you can only have church in the church. But we're the church. Not the building. And I, I'm not really talking about getting together in houses necessarily. What I'm pointing out is the fact is that they didn't just stick together for morning worship. They got together for fellowship. And that is maybe in the American church, the biggest thing that has fallen off over the last 20 or 30 years is that we have decided that Jesus is a Sunday morning only affair. And we don't have any fellowship in our lives. And it's hurting us. He says, they were breaking bread from house to house and they ate their food. How? With gladness. And simplicity of heart. They were praising God and having favor with who? All the people. All the unbelievers. You know what Jesus said? He said, you know how the world will know you're my disciples? By your love for... Do you all, do you all see this? It wasn't just them getting together to, for morning worship. It was the fact that they were always spending time together in fellowship. That made the world say, what? What is different about these people that love each other so deeply that they want to eat together and spend time together? Listen, that, that they do life together. And notice what happened because of this. And the Lord added to the church 
Not just on Sunday. I mean, I want to have church where every Sunday people get saved. But according to the Bible, we need to have the church in such a way that every day people are getting saved. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's all about. And so, yes, live. The part I've already spoken about, learning to live, learning to come and worship and get in the Word and, and listen, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, all of that is just awesome. But we need to learn to love too. We've got to come and fellowship with one another. And listen, there's simple ways to do this, like coming out to men's on Wednesdays or coming out to, to women's on Thursdays here at the church. And just like we already spoke about this morning, having Sunday night where we come out and we're here for fellowship. Not every service has to be just like this service. That's not in the Bible. In fact, I just read the Bible that it says just the opposite. I don't need a repeat of Sunday morning on Sunday night necessarily. If you do that, that's fine. I'm not against it. But I'm telling you that you need to be beyond just corporate worship into corporate fellowship. Oh. You know what they found? If you just come on Sunday morning but you never do anything else, you are five times more likely to slip back out of church as the person who gets involved in fellowship too. In other words, getting involved in fellowship, like coming out on Sunday night to a small group or coming out on Wednesday night to men's group or Thursday, whatever it is, what it does is it makes you sticky. In other words, you come and you don't get back up because you get stuck. And you're glad you're stuck. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time you become a sticky Christian. And what ultimately will happen is this, in a real church where you're learning to live, you're learning to love. The Bible says this so clear. James put this way, he says, don't, don't love in just word only, but in deed. In other words, don't just say you love one another, show it by your actions. And so the third step this morning, learning to live, learning to love, and learn to serve. Learn to serve. I promise you I won't be but another 45 minutes or so. I probably won't break that promise. See, serving you isn't really so much about me. It's about blessing you and glorifying God. Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said this, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. You know what happens? <laughs> Let me think, look, at, look at it this way. When Paul described himself, remember he wrote a third of the New Testament. He's an apostle. He's a prophet. He's a teacher. But when you read his epistles, you know what he would say? The apostle Paul, a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw himself, his highest office, was the man who served the church and glorified God. And the problem at Cornerstone, to be honest with you, this is our problem. Sunday morning is just way too good. <laughs> it is one of the biggest hindrances to us serving. Because it's so good, none of us want to miss anything. It's like... I don't want to miss a moment of, of talking to people. I don't want to miss a moment of, of, of the music. Hopefully you don't want to miss the sermon. And, and, and so when we say things need done, you're like juggling that back and forth. You know, it's like, well, I know they need help in the nursery, but I can't be in the nursery and be down here, right? And, and is anybody following me? The cost is kind of big, and that's a good thing. I, I, I'm excited that we have something to give up in order to serve. But the thing is, is that the greatest among us, in other words, those of us who are the most mature, realize that there's more to church 
than what we're going to get. Because the problem is this, I'm already going to heaven. I've already got everything I'll ever need. But there's a world around me that doesn't know Christ. It gets real quiet in here. When you're talking about trading up Sunday morning, this is what I'll say. You're talking about trading a good service possibly for somebody's eternity. And when I put that in the balance, well, that makes it a lot different, doesn't it? Maybe playing on the worship team wouldn't be such a burden. Maybe going upstairs in the nursery. And listen, the amazing thing is this, is when you have a church that serves, you didn't like you have to miss church all the time. Because when you have a church that serves, most of the time, you might only be in the nursery once a month. Or helping kids' church once a month. It's true, isn't it? Now, if you have a church where you expect one or two people to do everything, then they have to miss church all the time. But when you have a church where we are actually making disciples and everybody gets involved, then when everybody does something, nobody has to do everything. Praise God! Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do anything once a month. It's not too much for somebody's eternity. It's so worth it. And the thing is this, is when I don't serve, I'm robbing myself. It says in Acts 20, verse 35, this is the Apostle Paul, he says, I have shown you in every way how by laboring, working like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He said, it is more what? Blessed than to receive. When I greet visitors at the door, I'm blessed. When I talk to visitors in the sanctuary, I'm blessed. When, listen, when you teach kids and you watch the lights come on, all of a sudden somebody, one of those kids receives Jesus, then the next week you see him baptized, who you're blessed. When you see the youth getting on fire for God, you get the most blessing. It's more blessed to give than receive. Shoo. People with servants' hearts are the happiest people. Amen. More blessed to give than receive. First Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a gift. Turn to your neighbor and say, Each one is talking about you too. Each one has received a gift. Well, I, I'm, I can't preach. I can't sing. The water is in the, or the wine is in the water. You've received a gift. The reason you may not be a preacher is because hopefully you already have one. But I I can't run the sound, run the camera, greet at the door, pass out visitor cards, take up an offering, preach a sermon, lead the worship. And all the while, there's all these kids, the biggest (laughs) blessings in the church. They must have known I was talking about them. I can't do it all, but we can. We can. In Matthew 25, 21, it says, And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. I want you to know, sir, he doesn't say successful servant or famous servant. He just says good and faithful. And you are faithful over a few things. You can do anything once a month. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into what? The joy of your Lord. Could it be that the gateway to your freedom and joy you've been standing in front of for a long time, you've been 
the plug blocking your own blessing. We think too small, ultimately. I heard a story about a guy who went fishing and he stood out there all day and there was a guy on the other end of the stream and this guy was catching a lot of fish. And he would catch these great big nice fish and throw them back. And then he would catch these little scrawny things and he'd keep them. And this went on all day and finally the fellow just couldn't resist and he waded across the stream and he said, Sir, I've got to ask you a question. He said, you're a fantastic fisherman. You've caught way more fish than I have. He said, but you keep throwing all the good ones back. He said, why are you keeping these little scrawny fish? And he said, well, that's simple. I only have a six-inch frying pan. (laughs) He didn't come expecting anything more. And he put his own limits on himself, didn't he? God is looking at our church saying, you have the ability to live a life that is absolutely abundant. But he's asking us, are you living it with a six-inch frying pan? (laughs) You have the love of God in you. But are you loving with a six-inch frying pan? And he's looking at our church. He's saying, this church has the ability to change the world. You have the seeds of greatness in you. But are you serving God with a six-inch frying pan? Instead of rising to the potential that He has for you. The river is rising. The tide is coming up. Higher and higher. And God is saying to the church, it's time to get ready for real revival. This morning we're going to sing about the river rising. The worship team will come forward. I ask you this morning, are you living with a six inch frying pan? Or are you living the abundant life? Are you loving with limits because you're out of fellowship? You've limited yourself to just Sunday morning. That's it. That's, that's all the further I'm ever going to go. <sighs> Take the limits off. And maybe you've been serving with limitations. And God is saying this morning, it's time to take the limitations off. Amen. The wine is in the water. And He's about ready to take you and tilt you and pour through you. Amen. And you're not just going to be blessed. You're going to bless everybody around you. You're going to be like King David. You're going to say, my cup, it runneth over. This morning, God is saying to us, let me get you ready for revival. I not only want to make you my learners, my disciples, I'm going to make you disciple makers. You may be imperfect, and that's exactly what I was looking for. He's not saying, he's not looking for somebody who has it all together. He can't use them because they don't rely on him. He's going to find somebody that knows they've messed up. He's going to find somebody that's nervous as I'll get out. He's going to find somebody that's scared to death. He's going to find somebody that feels completely unworthy and incapable. And listen, He's going to fill them up with His glory and His presence and His power. And they're going to find themselves doing things they never expected, never thought, never imagined was ever even possible. And He's going to take their lives and He's going to turn it completely around. But through them, He's going to change the lives of multitudes. I'm looking at people not only with changed lives, but people who are changing the world. Right here in West Virginia, now is the time. The river is rising, and it's time for us to be ready. Hallelujah. Church, let's stand this morning. And these altars are open to let God fill you full of life, full of His love, full of a servant's heart. The wine is in the water. Let Him pour out into your life 
that He might pour through your life. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let us worship church. Let us receive. Holy Spirit, come and pour out in this place. Take it to a new level today in Jesus' name.